Well, thank you, music team. That is one of the most profound hymns we could sing. The message is amazing. And it goes along with our passage of scripture this morning tremendously. I don't know if anyone from the first service stayed to hear the music again in the second service. I encourage people to stay and come back for the second service, even though they've been through the first service, uh, just so that they could listen to the music and see how much the music uh, just really dovetailed well into, um, into the passage this morning that we're going to look at. Well, this morning I'm going to change it up just a little bit. Again, we welcome you if you're a first-time visitor here with us today. We have a couple of announcements, and uh, the reason I'm going to do the announcements now is because at the end we're going to do something a little different, and we're going to close with a time of prayer. And so let me just urge you this morning to um, remember a couple of things. You've got bulletins that are full of announcements. I mean, they are just like chock full, page after page. Uh, one of the things you'll see in there, uh, men's fraternity, we're going to have it tomorrow night, whether it snows, ices, or whatever it does. We are just getting together, so just plan to come. And I uh, want to mention, too, there's uh, a Nerf activity. Uh, there's a table out in the foyer. You can check that out. That's this coming Saturday night, so you want to be... Uh, aware of that, um, you might have to go shopping and get a Nerf gun. Uh, also want to mention that there are missions trips in your bulletin too, and it may seem early for thinking about a missions trip, but it's really not. So if you have interest, you really want to dive into that and, and get that uh, taken care of. You'll need passports and so forth, I'm sure, if you don't already have one. So just some thoughts there for you. Also uh, want to mention that last Sunday we rolled out some of the changes that will be occurring here at Faith Community Church beginning uh, February the 11th. And so February the 11th we have some changes. If you were in the service last week you, you saw part of this slide presentation. I told you this week we would talk about why these changes uh, are coming. What are the changes? Well we have a theme for this next year, worshiping together learning together and serving together. And the component that deals with worshiping together involves a time change. And so you'll want to pay attention to that whenever there's a time change. Now, I told the folks in the first service, you don't have to pay attention because you come at 9 o'clock, you just still come at 9 o'clock. And those of you who are tending to be 15 minutes late, you don't have to pay attention either. You just show up at 11. It'll be perfect. The big change here uh, comes from learning together. And this is the, the time in between our two services from 1010 to 1050. Uh, we'll be having ABFs uh, that we'll be referring to, which is short for Adult Bible Fellowship Classes. In both our first service, second service, there will be the full range of children's ministries. During this middle section, there is something for everyone as well. But there will be children's church during that time period. And there will be these Adult Bible Fellowships. And so these classes are definitely important. There will also be opportunities to be involved as uh, schedules have, have kind of opened up. You'll have the opportunity, hopefully, to get involved in different ministries and to be able to serve the Lord with more freedom in the days ahead. Why the change? This was the question proposed uh, last Sunday. Well, we want to provide uh, a twofold objective here. And the first is we want to produce a methodology that easily assimilates people into faith community church. Uh, some people like to just come in and go out, um, and you can continue to do that. Uh, other people want to find out more, they want to get plugged in, they want to have some connectedness. And one of the ways we'll be able to produce that is to be able to invite people to these classes where there'll be people maybe from their own backgrounds and stages in life and so forth and surround each other with opportunities to fellowship. Second of all, we want to encourage discipleship. We want people to be able to grow. We want to be able to, to go through various theologies, giving us a, a baseline, uh, why we believe what we believe. And uh, there'll be electives as well mingled in. Uh, when we start February the 11th, and I'll talk more about this, but February the 11th, all the ABFs will be actually teaching the exact same topic. They have the same handouts. They have the same lesson material. I'm sure teachers will bring in other things, but it'll all be very consistent. In fact, it'll lead us right into our spring Bible conference because the topic will be the same. More about that coming soon, so just keep that in mind as well. How can these things occur, this twofold objective? We want to create a class, again, for people and encourage fellowship to occur not only within the class setting, but also outside the class. We'll be talking more about that. But there will be encouragement for your class to be able to have functions outside of that 10-10 uh, 
to 1050 window. And so we may see people fellowshipping and classes fellowshipping on Saturday nights or Fridays or Sunday afternoons, whatever that may be. We also want to be able to have, as I mentioned, that curriculum that basically uh, gives to us a, a baseline uh, of theology uh, along with some pertinent electives that some of the, the teachers will choose. So some of these things moving forward, we hope will be very uh, helpful. The current classes as presently constituted will remain. Uh, we are going to be doing some things differently to increase space. Most of them are space bound. There will be one new class that will actually be meeting here in the auditorium and we project having a next, another class added next year. We don't know where this will all go, but information will be coming out as we progress. I think every one of us would agree that assimilating people into faith, community, church, and discipleship is important, and you'd give that idea, the concept anyway, a thumbs up. We know that there's a lot of different ways to do things, but the objectives are good. And we'd ask you to be in prayer that as we go through this and we experience bumps in the road, as we know we're going to experience, that uh, the prayer that we pray will be that these objectives are met and that God will receive the glory in the end of it all. Again, the objective is to worship, learn, and serve together. All right. Take your Bibles, please. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And if you would be so kind as to stand, I'd like to read just a couple of verses here in chapter 9, and I'll begin in verse 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Father, we pray that you would bless the word of God to our hearts this morning. Help us, Lord, as we As we set a time this side for examining your word, Lord, may your spirit truly teach us. Guide us, Lord, today and challenge our hearts, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I told you last week that uh, if you were visiting with us, uh, that I had to apologize because I was speaking on giving and speaking on money. And here's the interesting thing. There weren't uh, inspired chapter breaks when they translated the scriptures. And so I'm going to just kind of go back to what I said last week, because if you're visiting with us now and you visited last week for the first time, you're like here two weeks, you're sitting there going, oh no, this is all this guy talks about is money. Um, But we're actually doing a study here in 2 Corinthians and we were in chapter eight last week. We're in chapter nine today. There was no such thing as a chapter break in between. And so the, the, the theme is consistent. I want you to see here several things that are very, very important for us today. Now, a little bit of background, just to kind of fill in the blanks. If you look at verse 1, Paul says, uh, for it's superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry um, to the saints. He says, for I know of your readiness. I know you're prepared. And he goes on to say, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year. Your zeal has stirred up most of them, but I have sent the brethren in order that our boasting about you may not be made empty in this case, so that I was, I was saying you may be prepared. Otherwise, verse 4, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this confidence." A little bit of background here. The believers in Jerusalem, where it all started, are having difficulty financially. There's a famine, and Paul is seeking to take up a collection for these people who are suffering in Jerusalem. And he has gone to the Corinthian church a year before, and the Corinthians made a promise to give so much money to the needs of the people in Jerusalem. However, Paul is following this up, and what Paul is saying is, uh, don't be unprepared when I come. 
uh, because it will look bad. And the very nature of the encouragement that was extended to the Macedonians uh, will be in reverse and it will be discouraging to them. He has commended the Macedonians to the Corinthians in chapter 8. We learned that last week. He had told them how wonderful it was that the Macedonians had given themselves first to Christ. And then he says, based upon that commitment that they'd given to Christ, they gave out of their deep poverty and much affliction. He did, they did that out of an outpouring of love towards the things of God. Now, how bad is it going to look? Are you with me? How bad is this going to look uh, if the Macedonians find out that the Corinthians didn't follow through? You see, the very thing that got him encouraged would be very discouraging. Paul says, I'll be embarrassed, and you should be embarrassed as well if this offering doesn't take place. Now, here's something that's really exciting to me. It is exciting to see the church get fired up for what God is doing, and it becomes contagious. It really does. I mean, we ought to be excited about seeing God at work. Would you agree with that? We ought to be. And it's a terrible thing if we go weeks and weeks and months and months and never see God at work. God is at work. And we want to be able to see that. We want to be able to get excited about that. That is a, a very basic thing. I remember a, a missionary who the church in Pennsylvania had supported for many years. Uh, he was ministering in a very hard area. He was over in Italy. And it was difficult. And he'd been there for decades. And they'd seen very little fruit. And I remember him calling me on the phone. We talked about him. He was on furlough, and he was going to be coming to the church. And I talked to him, and he was really discouraged. And uh, he knew that if the Lord would provide a building, that maybe they could get some traction there in Italy, and they could see some things happen. About that same time, we had built an activity center, a uh, full-size gymnasium just about uh, there in uh, central PA. We were using it for outreach and so forth. And we had a, a small loan on it, about 70000 I think we owed the bank, and we were taking up a, a regular periodic collection for debt reduction. There's nothing too exciting about debt reduction Sunday, but we were doing that. And the Lord was paying that all down. That, that was great. And uh, I went to the leadership of the church, and I said, you know, Brother Fred is a discouraged man. He's been serving the Lord, and nothing's really happened uh, with regard to this need for a building. Uh, would it be all right, he's going to be coming, and he was coming uh, in a very short time, would it be all right if instead of our debt reduction Sunday offering, we took up an offering to give to him to put towards a building? And uh, we all thought that was a great idea, so before he came, we took this offering up. And uh, we were able to give him uh, uh, an offering less than $20,000, but it was something that was able to be used towards this building. And he put that out. He was so excited. He put that out in an email uh, to uh, his supporters. And there was a family up in Buffalo, New York, that were retiring to Florida. Sounds reasonable. And uh, they were selling their home. And uh, they, they saw that, that this, this church had given this gift. And they thought, we really don't need the $50,000 or so from our house. Uh, so we're going to give that money when we sell our house to this uh, project. Someone else in his church who was a professional soccer player from Brazil decided, wow, this, this is kind of great, and traction was beginning to, to come along. And not only he, but other people in the church said, you know what, we want to give to this as well. And it wasn't too long after that that the Lord provided them with a building, their own place to meet. And, you know, you go on now and you look at the Christmas services and you see 150 people, 220 people who are there hearing the gospel. The church is getting up and going. Uh, his sons and, and family are, are helping in the ministry there. And it's just wonderful to see after decades, uh, God doing some amazing things there in a tough place to minister. And it was, it was all begun when people, uh, God's people started to get excited. And, you know, that's what happens. Uh, we give a little bit, we give a lot, whatever, and it gets people excited about giving. It gets people excited about what God's doing. Well, this is the same mentality. Paul is saying, listen, uh, the Macedonians are giving because the Corinthians were excited. And now he goes back to the Corinthians and he says, don't let me down on this, you know, uh, follow through. Uh, we want to be encouraged and we want to see what God is doing. This leads us to verse six, which tells us that the giving is to be proportional. He says, now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. If you flip back a few pages, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is a very well-known passage when it comes to giving. And it says here, 
Now concerning the collection for the saints. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's talking uh, a year earlier about this offering for the Jerusalem saints. And he says, as I directed the church of Galatia, so he's been to Galatia, Achaia, Macedonia, Corinth. He says, on the first day of the week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. I can't tell you why Paul did not want to have the collection when he came. Uh, I would think that that would be a great time to do this collection. But maybe he didn't want people uh, to give because they felt that they had to give. Maybe he didn't want them to give based upon the motions. He wanted them to purpose in their heart what they would give and then give it. This proportional blessing is seen here as Paul kind of breaks this out in kind of a proverb type of uh, way. And he talks about these uh, very important aspects when he talks about the giving being proportional. Now, the giving is to be proportional, and it's also to be optional, and it's also to be transformational. One of the laws of the harvest, and there's probably seven laws of the harvest, and they're, they're, they're all very significant. But these laws of the harvest, the first one is, you cannot reap what you never sowed. Does that make sense? You you, you don't reap what you never sow. In other words, the farmer doesn't go out there in the fall and say, where in the world is my corn? And his wife looks at him and says, yeah, well, you forgot to put the seed in the ground. Ah, you kidding me? It's not going to come up? Of course it's not going to come up. The idea of laws of the harvest, you can't reap what you've never sowed. Second of all, you'll always reap more than you've sowed. Always. If you put a kernel of of corn in the ground, what grows from that is going to be an entire stalk. And on the stalk, you're going to have heads of corn, those ears of corn. And on each ear, you are going to have hundreds of kernels. And so that one kernel is going to produce hundreds hundreds of kernels. Now that's a great point to stop and consider. It is one of the laws of the harvest. And it is really an encouraging law, provided you're sowing things that are good and not bad. In other words, if you sow those things which are bad, you're going to reap bad consequences, and you will reap bad consequences many more fold than what you actually sowed. So stop and think about that. You'll also reap in a different season than when you sow. That might sound uh, kind of you know, not profound, it's kind of common, but you don't sow something and then have a time of harvest the next day or the next week. There is time involved. Your life and my life is a reflection of what we have sown and what we have reaped, and we may be reaping today things that we have sown 10, 20, 30, 50 years before. And we will continue to reap repercussions, both bad and good. The last one I want you to think about is that we can't do anything about last year's harvest, but we can do something about next year's harvest. Last year is so last year, isn't it? But next year, it's yet to be determined. With this in mind, Galatians 6, 7, stop being deceived for that which a man sows that will he also reap. Notice there again, verse 6, where the apostle writes and says, on the heels of saying, I want to encourage you to follow through with your commitment. He says, now this I say, he who sows sparingly will guess what? Reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And so this is an important point, isn't it? There is no question about this. And one of the things that we look at here with regard to this giving, and somewhere I lost a slide in there, uh, but when we look at this giving, we see how significant it is to look at what do we want from this? How is God purposing in your heart? Oftentimes we look at our lives and we think, well, yeah, I mean, I want to be blessed. I want to be able to reap a great harvest. I think all of us would say that, wouldn't we? We we, we want to be able to see a bountiful harvest. Paul makes that point. You won't see it if you don't sow bountifully. 
Now, the second point we stop to consider is there in verse 7, and this has to do with options. He's talking about optional giving. And I pick this up in verse 7 where he says, Each one must do just as he purposed in his heart. Without a doubt, there comes a point where God's Word is telling us that we have the opportunity to make a determination in our heart how much we are going to sow. Now, this is interesting here to me because so many times we've looked at this and we've thought to ourselves, well, isn't there, isn't there a number? Isn't there something I'm supposed to give? When we think of tithing, for instance, in the Bible, uh, the New Testament does not command tithing anywhere. We would say that tithing is biblical, and I grew up tithing, and we taught our children the importance of tithing, and we've got good testimonies and stories to tell. But as you go back through, the argument usually goes back to, for instance, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. And the prophet Malachi is coming to the people of Israel and he accuses them of, of robbing God. And he, the, the word back is, well, how have we robbed you? And Malachi says, well, you've robbed God in your tithes and offerings. Oh. And the people didn't like that. And so Malachi says, well, you need to give to God's storehouse this tithe. Now, it's important to understand the tithe is different in the Old Testament. In fact, it's more in line with taxes uh, because the people of Israel were commanded to give certain tithes. And this was what was missing here among the hearts of the people. Oftentimes the case for tithing today in the New Testament goes back to the reality that Abraham and Melchizedek gave tithes and that was before the law was given. Most of the things that are associated with the law we don't follow in the New Testament. Now interestingly, if we were to say that absolutely this is the reason for tithing, there are some holes in that bucket because you could make a case for the observance of the Sabbath before the giving of the law as well. Hmm. And we certainly don't emphasize that. You see, the point for us to stop and to consider is the essence of this passage, because what this passage is teaching is not so much about dollars and cents as it is what our love relationship to God is all about. And whether or not we really have the same heartbeat that God has. I looked through and I found 25, maybe more, theologians of great renown who would say that the New Testament absolutely doesn't teach tithing. And I, I came across a, a couple that I particularly liked. Boyce, uh, John Montgomery Boyce says, sometimes in question and answer periods, he says, I'm asked whether Christians today are obliged to tithe. I suspect, he says, the questioner wants to know how little he must give to Christian causes and how much he can keep for himself. That's pretty much hitting it, doesn't it? The question is, does the Bible demand that I give a tithe or 10% of my income? Well, that's a great question. And see, the difficulty is, we're really saying, oftentimes when we ask that, well, how little do I really need to give? Ryrie, Charles Ryrie says, not even the most ardent tither would say that the Sabbath should be observed today because it was observed before the law, yet this is the very reasoning that's used in promoting tithing today. You say, Pastor Kevin, don't you believe in tithing? Well, I believe tithing is a great place to start. But I believe that as I look at this passage, and especially looking here at verse 7, that God is saying, I am really, really more concerned about your attitude towards giving than the actual amount that's given. You see that in verse 7? Each one, he says, must do just as he's purposed in his heart. I like to start out the year and be able to say, this is how much my financial goal is to give this year. These Corinthian Christians were being called upon to give as they had purposed in their heart to give. But he is not saying here that it needs to be X number of dollars. You know, I remember a church. This, it, it, churches do the craziest things. I just want to be honest with you. 
I, I was a young kid. I'm like 27 years old exactly at the time. And we're doing a church plant, um, straight up missions up in central New York. And I went and visited this family. And uh, they had come to the church to visit one Sunday. So I knocked on their door and I said, you know, good to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And they told me, they said, well, the reason we're looking for a new church is, is because we got this in the mail from our old church. And they handed me these papers and I started looking through the papers. It was unbelievable. The church had assigned each person in the church a number that they had to give. And basically, we're threatening them that if they didn't give this amount of money throughout the next year, I mean, they were mentioning collections. Now, can you imagine? Now, see, the problem with this is God loves a cheerful giver. And that's why he says here in verse 7, I don't want you to give grudgingly or out of necessity or out of compulsion. I don't want you to feel that you have to give. That's not what God is interested in. In fact, isn't that the entire theme of the New Testament? We ought to, greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. I mean, this is what God is looking for. He wants all of us. He wants us to be all in. He wants every little bit of us. And he is asking for us to come alongside of him and join him in the things that are truly important to him. This is his heartbeat. This is why he says, pray according to my will. Do these things because I matter most to you. I'm not here to argue with you about how much you ought to attend church. And I'm not going to certainly argue about how much money you ought to get. But if you earned $1,346.23 last week, and you're writing out a check for $1,302, and you're trying to figure out how many pennies you owe God, you're in the wrong place. Spiritually, you're in the wrong place. Because somehow you're thinking to yourself, I have this great compulsion. Now, I just love to give away money. I really do. I, I mean estimated quarterly tax are due. What was it, Monday or Tuesday this week? And so this afternoon, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write out a check for the U.S. Treasury. Can I just tell you how excited I am about doing that? <laughs> After all, I live in the greatest country. I, we have religious freedom. We have all of these things to be proud of. It's just a wonderful country. And I get to write out a check to the U.S. Treasury. And right after that, I get to write one out to the Comptroller of Maryland. Woohoo! You say, well, Pastor Kevin, I think you're being sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, you'd be pretty much right. <laughs> See, God doesn't want you to look at it and say, oh, wow, I got a good paycheck. You know, I, I got this much money. Oh, yeah, but I got to give 10% to God. You don't have to give anything. In fact, if you view that you need to give this money to God and you have to do it, just put it away. You got bigger problems. In fact, God will take care of all the situations that need to be met with other means. In fact, just step out of the way because I'll show you how God does this. You see, that's where the giving part becomes transformational. You see, God wants us to give with a cheerful heart. The word cheerful there means, uh, it, it, it comes kind of, the, the derivative comes from exhilaration, to be exhilarated about giving. A uh, hilarious giver is the idea. You're giving with so much joy that it's just contagious. I mean, you just want to laugh. Can we turn that up? <laughs> exactly why we don't pass an offering plate here because there'd be so much of this laughter going on we just have to stop the service God says I want your heart and when I have your heart it's not going to be a question of, of what you give or what you don't give do you realize that that most most Christians uh, in churches today, uh, the, the total giving is, is about two and a half percent, about five percent tithe in the churches that are filled with Christians. In, in fact, the interesting thing is Christian families making less than 20,000 per year, eight percent of them gave at least 10 percent, but families making 75,000 or more uh, goes down to about one percent. Hmm. I like these statistics. About 10 million tithers in the United States donate $50 billion a year 
the Lord's work. That's pretty cool. Now listen to this one. 77% of those who tithe gave 11 to 20% or more. Huh. So, so 5% in the church tithe. And out of that 5%, almost 8 out of 10, don't stop at 10%. They give more, hence leading to the $50 billion that's going to the Lord's work. You see, to restrict you, I I could say, well, you need to give the tithe, and you better do it, and and you grudgingly write out a check, you're going to miss all the blessings. Are you with me? You're going to miss all the blessings. You're going to give in in such a way that's the opposite of of joy and laughter. You're going to give because you feel like you have to, and that will disappoint the very heart of God. Now, according to this passage, the last thing I want you to see is that this giving is transformational. You're here this morning and you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, I really would love to be able to to give, uh, but I don't have anything to give. Notice what this passage says here in verse 10. It says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Right in the beginning of verse 10, it says, now he who supplies seed to the sower. Here's the illustration. You pull out your your pocket and you say, I don't have anything. You know, it's kind of like when I was a kid, you know, and we went to the zoo. My parents were poor and everybody else could feed the animals. But Kevin couldn't feed the animals. He had no money. His parents had no money. I would pick up little things on the ground and try to feed them to the poor animals. That's all made up. I, that's not true at all. <laughs> I just want to see if you're paying attention. You, you, on a serious note, what he's saying here is you, you don't have anything. And he said the reason you don't have anything is because everything you do have belongs to God. And God is the one who is pouring the seeds into your pouch so that you can go out and you can spread them. Here is what he's saying. He's saying the power, and this is where it's so transformational. If I could make an illustration, I would have a glass in my hand, and that glass would be empty. I don't have any seed to sow in this glass. It's an empty, you can see it, glass. And now there's a pitcher, and it is God who has all the seed, and he has the seed. Look at it all. It's in the pitcher. I can't even tip it. And and God is pouring into, out of this big pitcher, into this small glass, And as he keeps pouring this in and pouring it in, the strangest thing happens. It just keeps overflowing and it just keeps coming out more and more and more. It is God who is able to do that. It may be that God wants you and he may want me to be a conduit for the things that he is doing. In other words, if we look at it and we say, oh, this is great, look, I'm overflowing, you know, quick, pick that up, put it in our bank, you would miss the point. God has used people over and over and over again to further his work. I recall when we were church planning up there in Syracuse and we went up, we first went up and we went up there because the pastor of the seminary and church where I was, had gone uh, was burdened to start 100 churches on the East Coast. And there was a man in the church who also had felt that burden and he had determined that he would give tremendous amounts of money as God provided to the establishment of these churches. And so we went to Syracuse and the mother church paid all of our bills and expenses, including health insurance for the first year. This man in the church was behind it. He had a small fastener company. And he would say to me, uh, one time we had a discussion, and he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I'm just amazed. He said, I write these checks, and he was in partnership with his brother. That was a crazy thing, and his brother thought he was nuts. But he would give and give and give and give, and as opportunities would come up, he just kept giving. And he looked at me, he said, I can't outgive God. Every time he would give it away, God would pour more in, and it kept overflowing, and he's throwing it as fast as he can throw it. 
You know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, we think of uh, Robert Mueller, you know, with the Mueller, with the, the orphanage, and he would pray, and he didn't have two nickels to rub together. A lot of people don't realize that the amount of money that Mueller gave not only to his orphanage and funding all of these things, he gave exorbitant amounts of money to Christian work. And he did that because it was God who was pouring it into his cup, and he wasn't throwing it into his bank. He was getting the, the, the things that God is pouring into his cup, and then he was using himself as a conduit. I, I remember going into the, the, the man I was just speaking about, I remember going into his home and thinking, man, this thing really needs to be updated. He had a very modest home. But he was a conduit. As God was pouring money into him, he was blessed to be able to give it to others. God, when it comes to giving, can transform us. And this verse here, verse 12, for the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. God is able to do that. And the key question is, not one about money at all. The key question is about our heart. Would we want to be a conduit? Oh, yeah. This has nothing, just so you realize, this has nothing to do with a prosperity gospel. I'm going to give so that God gives more to me so that I can buy a jet. God says, you want to be blessed so that you can continue to bless. Think of the blessing that that is. That man is now in glory, and I would say he laid up treasures in heaven. He allowed himself to be a useful tool of the Lord. Paul is saying to the Corinthian Christians, will you sow bountifully and see me, God, produce bountifully? Well, the question is one that we can ask all day long. The answer, really, though, is in our relationship to the Lord. And oftentimes, where we do put our money really does answer the question. That's why Malachi is so profound. Because at the end of the day, the, the Jews who used to love to make excuses couldn't make any excuses when they were hit with the reality of, so where's your ties? <laughs> so where does your money go? Where is your heart? See, that's the question. God wants our heart. Some key points to think about. First of all is, are you excited about what God has done for you? Are you excited about what God's done? I don't know how you could sing that last hymn and not be absolutely ecstatic over what God has done for you. That is one of the most profound hymns. It just touched my heart. It's fantastic. They did a great job. That's true. But it was super. I mean, are you excited about what God's done for you? Second of all, are you excited about the opportunity to give to the Lord and his work? To get you fired up? Maybe the only reason you come here to church is because we don't pass the offering plate. You see, where's your heart? Are you more concerned with keeping most of what you have for yourself? Or are you excited about what God is doing? Let's just bow our heads before the Lord. Let's spend a moment in time just in prayer. Maybe you're here this morning, you're not sure about where you'll spend your eternity. Jesus Christ went to the cross and he died there for you and for me. Gave his life so that we could have eternal life through faith in Jesus. Jesus took upon himself the sins of the whole world, the Bible says. Went to that cross, suffered and died. His blood flowed so that the penalty for sin could be made to our holy God, our creator. Have you availed yourself of that? Have you by faith called on the name of Jesus Christ for salvation? 
If you haven't, why not do that right now in your heart? I hope right now we've been able to take a moment to pray. (coughs) Seek to make certain that our heart is in the right place. Would you look up here for just a moment? We're not done praying, but could I ask you to be in prayer for certain needs that have come to mind? I'd ask you to be in prayer. One of the elders, Brian Jenkins, asked me if we would be in prayer uh, for those who have parents who are going through difficult times. I know his, his father-in-law is, is very sick. Be in prayer for these who don't know Christ, who are afflicted. And there are several in the church, he told me, that are dealing with ailing parents. Also be in prayer, I know of, of multiple people in our church who are going through active cancer treatment for very serious cancer. If you'd lift up up a prayer, I'm not naming their names today, but if you'd remember those who are in great need. Some are having surgery this coming week uh, for different things, people that are physically uh, dealing with difficulty. Also, if you would be in prayer, I came across uh, an article from the persecuted church folks talking about Christians being persecuted in the world for their faith. They identified one particular people group within Christianity whose time is becoming more and more difficult, and that is uh, women, specifically single women, uh, not only doing missions work, but just naming the name of Christ, being forced to marry Muslim men in the Muslim countries and so forth. And I'd ask you to be in prayer. Um, One of our missionaries to a very secretive place there in Pakistan, as it turns out, Emily Wilbanks, has gone through a great trial. She came home last summer and uh, she was assaulted and gave birth uh, back in December. And I'd ask, uh, the elders would ask you to be in prayer uh, for her. Um, She lives with her mom, um, not too far away from here, and pray for her son who's been born. Um, She won't be going back overseas, but uh, we we wanna be in prayer for her. So there's, um, there's a lot to be in prayer for. And so I'd ask you this morning Um, if you would bow your heads and spend some time in prayer. And when you're done praying this morning, just um, quietly slip out uh, to the foyer if you would do that. Um, Let me have a word of prayer and then remain here if you would for a few moments praying for these needs. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, mindful of um, uh, the suffering, Lord, that is in this world today. And Lord, uh, we pray that... um, uh, these who are being afflicted, I, I think of uh, Emily, Lord, I lift her up before you, and uh, I pray that your encouragement and your grace would be upon her, and um, during this uh, trial, Lord, uh, Lord, we don't know how she feels, but we, we would just pray the Spirit of God to be a God of comfort. I also pray, Lord, for those who are regular attenders going through chemo and different treatments, Lord, and uh, Father, I, I lift them up before you and pray for um, our compassion to be upon them and, and strength, Lord, for them as well. And, and two, for others who've gone through uh, operations and those who are dealing, Father, as well uh, with future procedures and operations. Lifting up, Lord, those who are dealing with uh, ailing parents, Lord, many aging, many without Christ, Father. And we pray for their salvations. Pray that you would work mightily in their heart and life. Father, help us, Lord, to be people of prayer. And Father, help us to... Um, Lift up one another. Give us a great week, Lord, because we know that we have a lot to be excited about. We are excited to be uh, in a relationship with our great God through Jesus Christ. What a joy it is to have Christ as our Savior. And Father, help us, Lord, to express that joy in many, many different ways in our Christian walk. May we truly be honoring to you. And I pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Remain here in prayer.